I'm Tiffany. This is Towering TBR. If you're new, a little bit about me. I am chronically ill and disabled. I read a wide variety of books, nearly every genre, and I have two cats who occasionally make cameos in my videos. All right, today we are going to be talking about the eight books I read in the month of May. I had three five stars. This was a pretty good reading month for me. I do also have a couple of DNFs, so we'll start with those. I read the first chapter of The Wager by David Gran. This was one of my most anticipated books of 2023. Unfortunately, I was in a reading slump and nonfiction was just not doing it for me. So there was a long line at the library and I decided to be the thoughtful patron and just return it and get at the back of the line. So hopefully when uh, I'm in the mood for some nonfiction, I'll be able to pick it up again soon. The other DNF, to my surprise and chagrin, was In the Lives of Puppets by TJ Klune. If you're new here, TJ Klune is one of my favorite authors, and the fact that I DNF'd his brand new release was a little bit <laughs> surprising. However, because I have chronic migraines, I don't always read with my eyes. I have a lot of eye strain. And so I rely on audiobooks quite a lot. And this audiobook annoyed me. It's the same narrator as The House for the Cerulean Sea. And he does the same voice for Chauncey, one of the characters in that book. He does that same goofy type voice for one of the robots in this book. However, this robot had a lot more speaking lines or something because it was really irritating and grating. So I'm going to just try to read this book at a later time with my eyes. It's got quite a long line at the library, so I won't be getting to it anytime soon. I saw on Reddit, and now I'm really curious, that in the acknowledgments for that book, T.J. Klune says that this is not the book that he wanted, that he had to make a lot of compromises, and it wasn't exactly to his vision. And I'm really curious what he meant by that. If anybody has, like, seen an interview or knows the answer, let me know in the comments. So I split my monthly wrap ups into illustrated stuff, fiction, and nonfiction. So we'll start with the illustrated stuff category. And we're going to start with Unterzocken, which I have to show you the back because this is an interlibrary loan and it's got all my information on the front. So Unterzocken by Leela Corman is a graphic novel, black and white, that focuses on two young twin sisters uh, growing up in the Lower East Side of New York in the early 1900s. The book opens out with a really strong scene. There's a woman and she is laying out on the road and she's bleeding. And a woman grabs one of the little girls, Fanya, and says, go get Branya, the lady doctor. And so Fanya, at six years old, doesn't know who this person is, but runs around and yells her name and eventually finds her. And when they get back to the woman, she has passed. And we find out it's because she tried to give herself an abortion and she bled out and died. Branya, being an obstetrician and abortionist, takes an interest in Vanya and wants to teach her how to read and write and kind of have her apprentice. And so she has to ask the mother's permission. And the mom's like, oh, I guess you can teach her how to read and write, but you can't have my other one, Esther. Esther just wants to be famous. She wants to be a star. She's obsessed with dancers. And she gets a job at age 12 working for a woman who runs a burlesque program and is also a madam. And one of the prostitutes trick her, have her go into the room with a Jean. He forces himself on her. And when the madam finds out, she's she's not appalled like I would think she needs to be. This this girl is 12, but she's mad that she's like working without the madam's permission and like the madam getting a cut of the proceeds. So she's like, all right, I was going to have you be like a more special one, more discerning. But if you're going to do it, all right, I guess I'll give you permission, which... It's just totally messed up. And so the, the twins grow up and each think what the other is doing is immoral. We have Fanya, who is working as an obstetrician slash abortionist, and she's also giving out condoms, which 
is a huge deal back in this time. Esther has been a pro and one of her Johns basically is her sugar daddy. Like he just pays for all of her stuff. It was a really interesting story and I was really interested to see where it was gonna go but the ending felt incredibly moralizing to one twin only. It was underwhelming. It had a lot of promise, but I only gave it a three star. The other illustrated thing I read was Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo and Me by Ellen Forney. This is the author's graphic memoir about getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder. She is a cartoonist and was very concerned that being on medication would sap her creativity and make her less able to do what she loved. So she does a lot of research into other artists who had mood disorders. She takes comfort in that because it takes a while for her to get the right combination of medications. There's even an infographic on the different types of mood disorders. While she has bipolar one, which is considered the most extreme, there are lesser varieties, I guess, or different. She swings wildly between mania and depression. And her drawings of her depression, just being under a blanket, lying on the couch, not doing anything for like hours or congratulating yourselves for, you know, just getting out of bed or taking a shower or brushing your teeth. So her depictions of depression were really relatable to me. There was one that I found really particularly uh, poignant to me. And it, she talked about what it was like to escape her mental health issues through books. She would just not exist in this world anymore and exist only in books. And then when she finished the book, it was really jarring to come back to reality. And I have definitely felt that. I use books as a form of escapism all the time. There was a scene with her therapist that I wanted to point out as also relatable to me. Uh, her therapist wants to prescribe a new medication because what she has isn't working right now. And so she prescribes her a new medication and Ellen's like, is it going to be expensive? And the therapist doesn't know. But she says, that doesn't matter. I will imbue it with all of my hopes and dreams. And that is exactly how I felt when we were searching for medications to get my illnesses under control. It, you put so much hope into, okay, just around the corner. We've, we've got this. We just need it to kick in and then it will work. And... So I think if, if you have any mental health struggles whatsoever, I think you might find this really relatable. It definitely shows how distressing it can be to live with bipolar. At one point she says, I just want to quit. Can I, can I just be, quit being bipolar? And I have definitely felt that with my illnesses. Can I just quit being sick? Can we just put this on somebody else for just a little while? So I gave this four stars. The only reason I docked it is the art style is not my favorite. Uh, I feel it's more simplistic than I normally read, but her words were so impactful. I'm gonna start with my lowest rated and go to my best rated. So my lowest rated fiction book is The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. This is a YA mystery. And I thought there was gonna be more game element than there was. We follow a poor teenager named Avery who is basically just living in her car and she finds out that she was named in a will of a billionaire. A billionaire she doesn't know and so she needs to go out and be there for the reading of the will. And when they all assemble, the family and Avery, the family gets some things but Avery is willed the bulk of the billionaire's worth. But in order to get it, she has to live at his palatial Hawthorne house, um, where all the other family members live, for a year. The reason that is a bad idea is the family members are mad at her, and her life is at risk. She has to get a bodyguard. So I thought there was going to be, like, riddles and games and trying to puzzle out and figure out why this person was picked over anybody else, basically. The four grandsons of the billionaire feel like their, their grandfather was always like a puzzler, a riddler, and they basically kind of come together to try and figure out why Avery. And she ends up flirting with two of the brothers, which just felt icky and weird because in the beginning, it's 
posited that she could be a relative, which, yeah. And also, you don't know who is threatening you. They could be nice to your face, but why in the world would you want a relationship with somebody who might want to harm you? It just, that part was incredibly cringy, and I actually predicted one of the twists. There was no really, like, oh, that's great. And either they didn't really answer the question of why Avery was picked, or the small thing that they said about it is the reason, and it's totally dumb. (laughs) So I didn't enjoy this. I couldn't suspend my disbelief. This is like a trilogy or a quartet, and I just, I don't care to continue on. I gave it two and a half stars, but the more I talk about it, the more it's like probably two stars. This was not a good mystery book. I picked up Hang the Moon by Jeanette Winterson. She has written one of my favorite memoirs, The Glass Castle, that came out a few years ago, and this is her fiction book. We follow Sally Kincaid, the daughter of a wealthy rum runner, bootlegger, during Prohibition times. Sally's father killed Sally's mother and shortly after remarries uh, Sally's stepmom. She gets a brother out of this union. And one day there's an accident with her brother and the wagon. And the mom is basically upset because her, her precious baby got hurt and she thinks that Sally's just terrible and irresponsible. And so she talks her dad into sending her off to her aunt. She thinks she's only going to be there, you know, until her stepmom cools down. But she doesn't return to the family for nine years. When the stepmother finally dies, she is allowed back. And at that age, she's about 16 or 17. And so she starts working for her father in the rum running business. This book is set up in sections, and at the end of each section, a cliffhanger type dramatic reveal happens. And the first two times, I felt like it was within the story's bounds, and it was kind of interesting and exciting. But by the third, fourth, and fifth time it was happening, I felt like it was way too gimmicky, and I didn't care for it. Sally is a really strong character and eventually takes over the bootlegging business, and deals with competing rivals and all sorts of mishaps that can come, creating uh, liquor during Prohibition. I do feel like Sally's character is the only one that feels like a real person. I think everybody else feels very much flat and two-dimensional. So I didn't really enjoy this book all that much. Like, I enjoyed it while I was reading it, but I did never really want to pick it back up and, like, It's been pretty forgettable. I had to kind of really dig back into my notes to remember what happened. However, I did find two quotes that I really liked and I wanted to share them. The first says, Some say that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but that isn't always so. Many a time what doesn't kill you leaves you broken and crippled, unable to fight the next fight, and sometimes it leaves a wound in your heart so deep and ugly that it never truly heals leaves you bitter and angry, unable to forgive the world for its cruelty. So I felt like that was a really well-written part. The other quote that I wrote down was, we're a family. There are two kinds of families, those you're born into and those you put together from the pieces that don't go anywhere else. And this is one of those families. Unfortunately, it was kind of a disappointment. I gave it three stars. I guess I would recommend it if you really like prohibition stories or maybe even coming of age stories. For the Spoonie Readathon, which happened in May, I'll link my video in the cards and in the description below. I picked up The Middle Grade, The Chance to Fly by Ali Stroker and Stacey Davidowitz. This is a middle grade about Nat. She's 13 and she and her family have just moved from California to New Jersey. She thinks she's going to sign up to be part of wheelchair racing, which was something she did back before. But when she finds out that they are having auditions for a musical, Wicked, she decides she wants to audition and do that instead. She and I both love musicals so much. And all of the little Easter eggs in here that refer to different musicals, I just found such a pleasure to read. Do you like musicals? Because if you do, you might really like this book. So her parents are worried because she's never been in theater before and this is a new place. They don't know what kind of accommodation she might need. 
because she uses a wheelchair. And they don't really know any people who they feel like might be able to help. But they shouldn't have worried because the theater nerd people are awesome. These kids are so inclusive and so welcoming and stick up for her when she's discriminated against. I would said in that video that I was listening to the audiobook as well and that I wished the narrator would sing some of the musical lines because she she's a Tony Award winning singer and she was the first on Broadway to be uh, to perform in a wheelchair. So hearing her sing on the audiobook was was really enjoyable. I really liked that quite a lot. When they put on Wicked, they write something in the program that I thought was so good and I wanted to share with you. Wicked is a tale of perseverance. It's about doing right even when it's simpler to do wrong. It's about unlikely friendship and unlikely romance. It's about embracing your own differences and the differences of others. It's about reaching the stars and settling for nothing. So I thought that was really beautiful and helped describe Wicked in a way that maybe some people hadn't kind of thought of. During her performance, Nat taps into like all of the times she's felt isolated or othered and in a way she becomes the character. And she says, for the first time in my entire life, I felt unlimited. And that that is from Wicked, part of the song. And I just love how they wove that in. Yeah, so if you like reading middle grade or musicals or disability rap, I would highly recommend this. This was so fun to read. On a whim, decided to pick up Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. I picked up Babel by the same author a few months ago and I DNF'd it. I did not care for it at all. I had been seeing so much praise for this that I was intrigued and thought, hey, you know, contemporary satire might be much better than historical fantasy. This book is a skewering look at publishing, social media, cancel culture, who can write what stories. It's very of the moment and there are a lot of really topical references which make me feel like this probably won't have lasting power, but it's, it's incredibly of its time right now and important. However, I really did enjoy this. This is looking at a white character named June. She steals Athena's unfinished manuscript and decides that this is a great story and she wants to help get it out there. She starts revising and editing it and she presents it as if it's her own work, giving no credit to her friend Athena. Like she's obviously doing wrong, but the author is really good at helping understand why she feels like it's justified. I wrote down that she says in her defense, what more can we want as writers than such an immortality? Don't ghosts just want to be remembered? She's justifying her actions quite a lot. And I think the author did a good job of making her understand her thought process and why she did what she did. This also mentions the controversies of both The Help and American Dirt. This really reminded me of John Boyne's book, A Ladder to the Sky, which is also a book that looks at plagiarism. This is quite buzzy. I enjoyed it, but I don't think it's amazing. I gave it four stars. It's good, but it's not as good as everybody's hyping it up to be. Are you interested in reading this? I picked up and finished Don Quixote. Technically, I finished this on June 1st, but I'm counting it. I have a video of a chapter by chapter of the first part. And so I'll link that in the description and in the cards above. The second part's even funnier though. This this was such a fun experience. I loved the satire and humor and gave this four stars. Definitely worth reading. Now on to my five stars. I picked up The Chrysalids by John Wyndham. This is a sci-fi novella 186 pages and absolutely blew me away. We follow David, who's a child in the beginning of the story, and he is growing up in a dystopian world. Mutations are quite frequent. His community views mutations as mockeries of offenses, blasphemies. They are Satan making mockery of God's creations. And so they are ordered to be destroyed, whether they're plants or animals or people. It's quintessential othering for anyone not created what they consider a pristine body. 
one day he comes across this girl playing and they play together. And unfortunately, she gets her legs stuck under like a log. And he tries to help her out. He's like, I'll just take off your shoe and we, we can get your foot removed out of, we can get unstuck. And she's like, no, 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 you can't take off my shoe. And he's like, well, that's the only way we're going to get you free. We, we need to. It's getting dark. We, we got to go back. Eventually, she lets him take off her shoe, and on her foot, she has six toes. He, he's really starting to struggle because he's grown up with a preacher father who has said that these, these mockeries, these blasphemies, these offenses, they're not human, and they deserve to be destroyed. And he's very much starting to question that line of thinking and say, like, she seems like a human. She seems like a real person. And uh, so he's really starting to question everything he's been brought up to believe. There was a scene where a baby was born and they had to have it checked out officially. And when there was a noticeable deviation, they killed the baby. And that really reminded me of The Giver by Lewis Lowry. That's a, either a children's or YA classic dystopian book. If they aren't killed, then they are kind of forced to live on the fringes. David encounters a man from the fringes, and he says, The expression on his face made something clutch suddenly in my chest. I had never seen hatred naked before. The lines cut deep, the eyes glittering, the teeth looking like savage animals. It struck me with a slap, a horrid revelation of something hitherto unknown. This book talks about eugenics and ableism and keeping the human race pure and what all that uh, entails. This was poignant and thought-provoking, and I can't believe this came out in the 50s. It reads so modern. There's also a mention of a right-wing church party, and which just felt super prescient, especially for the U.S. But because this book is only 186 pages, I don't want to say more because I it would be easy to spoil it, and I don't want to. This was absolutely favorite. It is currently my top favorite book of the year so far. And if you have read any more John Wyndham, tell me where I should go next with him. I, I can't wait to pick up more of his stuff. The last fiction book I'm going to talk about was also five stars, and it was called The Lost Year by Catherine Marsh. This is a middle grade book uh, that came out quite recently. The story follows Matthew, a 13-year-old boy living during the 2020 COVID lockdown. His parents are divorced, and his father is currently in France as a journalist and is not able to get back to him. And Matthew is incredibly worried that his father will get sick and he won't be able to say goodbye. So kind of in an effort to distract Matthew, she ropes him into a project to help organize his great-grandma's pictures and documents and to go through all of her stuff with her and organize it basically. We then delve into her story growing up in Ukraine during the Holodomor. The Holodomor was literally means death by hunger and it was a man-made famine that killed almost four million Ukrainians between 1932 and 1933. Other people were affected by the famine as well, um, but there are several countries, including Canada, which view this as a genocide of the Ukrainian people. Not all countries ag agree with that, though. It's very widely debated. There, there were people starving to death. And so we delve into Nadia, the great-grandmother's story, as well as two other young girls, Mila and Helen. I hadn't heard of the Holodomor uh, when I was in school, and I'm curious, did you? Because this was huge. I mean, we definitely learned Stalin was bad, but I don't think we learned about this specific famine, which is nuts. I found the book to be really well linked between Nadia's story and some of the things that Matthew was going through at the same time. Uh, there was a really intriguing conversation that he has with his father via, like, FaceTime. After learning more about his great-grandma and Ukraine, he has done more research. And when he's talking to his father, he says, I was reading about how Stalin lied, not just to journalists from other countries, but to his own people. He pretended everything was going great, that there wasn't a famine. People, especially in other parts of the country, believed him. 
And his father says back, Sure is, but look at what's happening now. At least 10,000 people have died of COVID in New York City, but there's still a lot of Americans who think COVID is a myth or a government conspiracy trying to take away their freedom. It's the same thing we talked about before, the dangers of people getting information from unreliable or biased sources. Absolutely, with how much deep fakes there are and incredibly biased propaganda, it is incredibly important to figure out what sources you trust and to make sure they're verifiable by other means. And I think that that's such an important skill for children to learn, the critical thinking skills and, and knowing what is good journalism and what is biased. Awesome. I, I thought that was a great conversation starter. So her story is sad and moving, and there's a, there's a surprise along the way. I just, I thought this book was so great. I learned a lot. The characters were really well developed. The pacing was just on point. I didn't want to put the book down. And... Yeah, I'm gonna go check out her other books. I read Sitting Pretty by Rebecca Tausig, which is her memoir. I also mentioned some of my thoughts in the Spoonie video, which will be linked, but this book was phenomenal. Oh my gosh, I loved it so much. I am gonna go out and buy my own copy because I, there was just so much to quote and to underline and to tab. I just, in that video, I mentioned that Rebecca Tausig talks about the medical model and social model of disability. The medical model is that there's something broken with her, something deficient, something she needs to figure out how to solve. Whereas the social model views people as just requiring different needs. How can we make it inclusive for you? She said, when I look back and evaluate the most limiting, painful parts of my life, or even more specifically, the hardest part about being disabled, it's not just my legs. She's paralyzed and uses a wheelchair. It's stigma, isolation, erasure, misunderstanding, skepticism, and ubiquitous inaccessibility. And that part right there is the social model understanding of what it's like to live in an ableist world when you are disabled. And despite all that, my paralyzed legs are the only things outsiders seem to see. I do not use a wheelchair, but I am disabled in multiple ways. And I related so much with her and the way she's felt in different situations. She touches on how expensive it is to be disabled. Full-time is often out of the realm of possibility because of pain or low energy or other obstacles. And if you rely on the government, they often make you stay in poverty. And she, she talks about how capitalism is especially harmful for our ableism because we equate work and productivity is value. And so if your body is unable to work or produce as much as an able-bodied person, th then you are worth less than that able-bodied person. Really devalues the individual. She talks about inclusivity and how it really, it helps disabled people, but it helps other people as well. Closed captioning provides those with hearing impairments a way to access the stories and news delivered through their screens but it also allows everyone the chance to connect with videos, even if they have to turn their sound off or they can't understand a mumbler. The medical model of disability, the default setting in which sees individual broken bodies in need of individual solutions, misses so many opportunities to imagine a more flexible, accessible, inclusive, and inviting world for all of us. What innovations might be made to medicine in disabled bodies if disabled bodies were seen as conduits for innovation? What possibilities for play are we missing on playgrounds? What practices might we adopt in our educational systems to facilitate more flexible, more meaningful learning with more students? What would happen if we decided disabled bodies were worth including? She ends with a postscript because the bulk of this book was written before the pandemic, but she adds an addendum to talk about it, wrote something really powerful that I wanted to share. At the very same time, the virus has brought to the forefront the inherent frailties that come with living in a body, whether everyone acknowledges that or not. Almost overnight, workplaces made themselves more flexible, more accessible. They created accommodations previously pitched as impossible. A giant portion of the American populations suddenly found themselves uninsured simply because a force outside of their control decimated our economy. Hospital policymakers 
have grappled with whose lives to prioritize on those overcrowded floors, often revealing some of the ugliest ableist beliefs that humans still hold close. So while this whole book was incredibly meaningful to me, that epilogue was especially impactful because especially in the United States, our pandemic and our pandemic response proves that some people would rather elderly and disabled people sacrificed so that they could go back to normal. And that's a really hard thing to see. This book taught me a lot and made me feel seen. And I recommend it to all you Spoonies out there. And if you are not disabled, I still recommend it because she writes in a really accessible way that I think helps fight ableism in our own minds and, and with the people we talk to. And if she ever writes another book, I will be picking it up. So that concludes all of the books I read in the month of May. Most of them were great. What was the best book you read in May? And if you've read any of the books I talked about, tell me your thoughts on them. Let's have a chat down in the comments below. Thanks for joining. Bye.